Hello and welcome back to our look at the cardiovascular system. And in uh, this series of lectures, we're going to be focused more on um, the anatomy and the physiology or the regulation over our vasculature. So we're going to be primarily focused on arteries and veins throughout this series of lectures. Um, and to to start that, um, I'm going to start off with a little bit of a, of a story. And in fact, most of this lecture uh, is going to be focused on this story. There's going to be a series of four videos, by the way, for this week, uh, covering the cardiovascular system, mainly, again, the, the arteries and the veins and, and how things flow. But understand that our current understanding of um, the physiology of our arteries and our veins has evolved over time. And our current understanding of the uh, vasculature and how blood flows throughout the body really came about in the 17th century or, or the 1600s. Um, prior to that, prior to that, there was a whole host of different versions of how blood flowed through our arteries and our veins. Um, and, and it really came down to a guy by the name of William Harvey, who we're going to talk about a little bit more here in a few minutes, during the 17th century, that pointed to this idea that blood uh, flowed into the heart, flowed out of the heart to the, to the lungs to get oxygenated, flowed back into the heart, uh, for dissemination systemically, uh, and that this was a closed system. In other words, arteries and veins were not independent of one another, but they were actually connected to one another, and the connection was capillaries. Uh, and understand that uh, it, it took literally uh, almost 1,600 years to get to that point. It actually took a little bit longer. It, it really took, I, I would say, you could even say closer to 1,700 years to get to that understanding of the interrelationship between the heart, the arteries, the veins, and these things called capillaries. So why? Why, why, why this evolving understanding of the cardiovascular system? And, and the answer comes down to um, how the research was being done, how examination of the human body was taking place. And the greatest way that we study the body is through autopsy, through dissection. Uh, this is how we get that physical understanding, that anatomical understanding of what is happening within the body. We're seeing it, what we call the gross anatomy. We're seeing it in front of us. We see how tendons and muscles and bone connect. We see how arteries and veins are interrelated and interconnected and how they flow into the heart. We see all of these relationships through gross anatomy. But... The challenge with that is, in order to do autopsy, in order to really examine the gross anatomy of the body, we're talking about post-mortem, after death. And because, that, because of how we study the body post-mortemly, after the body has died, things change. For example... The very earliest anatomist, right, the very earliest anatomist, going back to 250 B.C., before Christ, before standard time. When the anatomists, which were really not anatomists, ins instead they were really philosophers that were intrigued by the body, uh, and so they studied the body from a very philosophical perspective, and that's what we refer to as an anatomist, back uh, in, in the 200 BCs. The earliest anatomists would go ahead and cut into the body for dissection. And when they cut into these very large, robust vessels that we call arteries, they were empty. There was no blood in them. 
and there was no blood in them, because when the body dies, blood is going to move to the point of lowest pressure, which is in the veins. And guess what? When these earliest anatomists, earliest anatomists, cut into the veins, they found blood. So arteries were empty, veins were full. Every time they cut into a body to do an autopsy, to do a gross dissection, arteries were empty, veins were full. And in fact, if you go back to the original Greek translation of an artery, an artery, that term that we use now, in Greek, means empty vessel. The vessels that carry the blood and pump it through our bodies are named for empty vessels because of that misidentification post-mortemly. Think about all your crime shows, CSI. Right? They find a body and it's determined that the body was moved from the site where that person ceased to exist. How do they know that? They look for bruising patterns. What does a bruise have to do with anything? Well, a bruise is simply blood that has pulled. And where does that blood pull? in the veins. And so if a person died on their side, let's say they're, they were left laying on their right side, that blood is going to pool on the right side of the body. There's going to be bruising. But if they find the body face down, and that body was moved after death, that blood isn't going to all of a sudden switch. It's going to stay pulled on the right side. And it's going to be in the veins, not the arteries. And so this idea that, that the veins accumulate all of the blood leads us to understand how a person dies in 2020. But when you go back to 250 BC, those empty veins, or I'm sorry, those empty uh, arterioles, meant something completely different to those earliest, earliest anatomists. And in fact, the earliest anatomist who studied the cardiovascular system was a Greek anatomist, 250 BC. And his name was Erasistratus. And Erasistratus proposed this model right here for how our cardiovascular system worked. And it was based on a closed system. It was based on, I'm sorry, it was based on an open system, not a closed system. It was based on an open system. Right? Check, check, check this out. Check this out. Here's, here's the heart. All right. The heart was proposed to simply be a pump for two different things. What do I mean by, what do I mean by two different things? Well, Erastostratus believed that the right side of the heart pumped blood. It believed, it believed that it pumped blood. Right? But that wasn't the primary function of the heart because you see the liver is black. Right? And the black structure represents the initial pumping of blood. And so they actually thought that the liver's job was to pump newly created blood. So the liver created the blood and pumped the blood. And it would pump the blood systemically. It would pump it up into the head, to the arms. It would pump it 
to the heart. And the reason why the liver would pump blood to the right side of the heart is so that the heart could pump the blood to the lungs so we could get rid of waste. Now that was our veins, because remember, the veins contained all the blood. Erastostratus then proposed that the function of the left side of the heart was to receive air. from the lungs and that the air would travel from the lungs to the left side of the heart and it was the job of the left side of the heart to pump the air through the body pump the oxygen throughout the body now you're, you're probably sitting there saying what what, what I, this makes no sense and you're right it doesn't it doesn't make sense because of our current understanding of the cardiovascular system but think about 250 bc limited technology literally going off a of visual interpretation of what they're looking at and these are arteries are all empty except had to just be for air and not only that but remember this is an open system so the liver is producing the blood it's pumping the blood it's going to the heart so that way it can be pumped to the lungs but when the blood got to the lungs when the blood reached the tissue that it was going to in the uh, in the abdomen and in the legs and in the arms and up into the head the blood would simply be absorbed by the tissue and the liver would make new blood. There's a fundamental problem with this. If the tissue is absorbing the blood being pumped through the veins, that blood is now sitting there. And if the liver is constantly producing new blood to be pumped through the veins, it is estimated that an individual would gain 500 pounds a day in the mass of blood. That is not feasible. But they didn't understand that 250 BC. But I will say that this worldly view of how the cardiovascular system worked that was originally proposed by, by Erasistratus survived for, three, for almost 400 years. 380 years, this philosophy, this view of how the cardiovascular system worked was accepted. Then, in 129 AD, follow, follow the progression here. This is 250 BC. This is uh, 200, I'm sorry, uh, this is 129 AD, after death. Right. So we're dealing with a span of almost... Just about 370 years. That was accepted. Uh -huh. Then this guy Galen came around. Now, Galen was another Greek physician. And so he had a little bit more medical behind him. He wasn't just an anatomist. He was a physician. And Galen... adjusted Erasistratus' view and said, no, nah, this ain't quite right. We think some of this blood entering into the right side of the heart is actually passing through pores 
connecting the right side and the left side, allowing blood to mix with the air coming from the lungs inside the heart. So, so Gallon, Gallon comes in and he's saying, yep, 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 liver is still producing the blood. Yep, yep, liver is still pumping the blood and it's pumping the blood through the veins and that blood's going down to the extremities, it's going up into the arms and the head. That blood is being pumped into the right side of the heart. All right? And that blood is still being pumped to the lungs. But there are these uh, passages, these holes, these pores going across the interventricular septum and going across the atria, the interatrial septum. That's allowing the blood to pass into the left side of the heart. The lungs are passing air through these arteries, and then the air is mixing with the blood <laughs> in the left side of the heart. And then that blood mixed with air is then being pumped to the brain, to the arms, to the thoracic cavity, to the abdominal cavity, down into the lower extremities. But it's still an open system. In other words, that blood is still being absorbed by the tissue and the liver is still making new blood. The person is still gaining 500 pounds a day, theoretically. That doesn't work. That doesn't work. But this lasted. <laughs> this lasted. This hypothesis lasted until the 1540s. This theory lasted. 1310 years? Gallon's perspective of how the cardiovascular system functions became a dogmatic belief. It became a dogma. It became a foundational understanding of how the cardiovascular system works and it was wrong. It's totally wrong. And it wasn't until Padal Colombo, Padal, P A D U A, it wasn't until Colombo came around, by the way, he was an Italian physician in the 1540s and said, nah, uh, something not right. The liver is still pumping the blood. He agreed with that. But notice what changes. Columbo theorized that it was within the lungs where blood became oxygenated. In other words, there was something within the lungs that connected the veins and the arteries. It was in the 1540s in Italy where the idea of a capillary was first recognized. And look what that did to the flow of the blood. For once, we have the beginnings of this idea of a closed cardiovascular system where the blood constantly circulates. Now, we're not quite there, but we're getting better. The liver is pumping the blood. And it's pumping the blood systemically through the veins. 
And these veins are then going to the heart, and the right side of the heart is pumping that blood to the lungs, where it passes across the lungs and goes back into the arterioles, oxygenated. And it returns to the left side of the heart, where the left side of the heart pumps this oxygenated blood throughout the body. But we still have the problem where we've got an open system. That blood's still not returning. That's going to the arms, the thoracic cavity, the cranial cavity, the abdominal cavity, and the lower extremities. So what changed? Well, Colombo's idea of the cardiovascular system didn't last very long because it was in the early, it was in the 1600s when William Harvey, an English physician, transformed the view of the cardiovascular system and for the first time recognized that our cardiovascular system was a closed system. And that it wasn't the liver pumping the blood, it was the heart pumping the blood. And that when the heart pumped the blood, there was a capillary bed at every junction throughout the body that allowed for the blood within the arterioles to pass through the tissue and then pass into the veins to be returned to the heart. This is the first time for so many things. This is the first time we recognize the cardiovascular system as being a closed system where the blood is flowing in a continuous loop. This is the first time we recognize that the liver is not the center of pumping of the blood, but it's the heart. And not only is the heart the center of the pumping, but it's that the arteries are carrying the oxygenated blood that is going to the tissues and then passing off into the veins and not the veins that are originating the carrying of the blood. And you ask how he discovered this. Oh, you didn't? Okay, well, humor me and pretend you did. All right. You just asked. <laughs> but young, how did he figure this out? He didn't work on cadavers. He wasn't looking at patients post-mortemly. He figured this out without ever having to cut into a single patient. He figured this out by taking their blood pressure. He applied a rubber tube around their bicep and tightened it, which clamped the brachial artery. And when they, he did that to his patients, his patients complained of numbness in the lower forearm. And he noticed that there was a backup of blood in the arteries in the lower forearm. Which meant that blood was not coming into the arteries and they weren't leaving either. That there was some kind of interconnectionness going on. The tissues weren't simply absorbing the blood anymore. And then he began to loosen the rubber pipe, the rubber tubing around the brachial artery. And as he began to do that, the patients could actually feel pulsing. And feeling began to return to the lower forearm as new blood began to flow into the arterioles, delivering oxygen into the nerve endings. And the pooling of the blood in the arteries and the veins dissipated. He demonstrated that there was a connection 
and that those capillary beds that Colombo first identified in the 1540s was not something specialized and isolated to the lungs. But they were throughout the body. And since the 1600s, this has been our working idea of the cardiovascular system. Now, again, I stress this idea that our understanding of the body is constantly changing and evolving and adapting as our technology, as our ability to examine the body becomes better. This is the perfect view. I got another story when we get into the digestive system. This is not a weakness of science, by the way. This is the strength of science. This is the beauty of science. That the more questions we ask, the more details we get, the more answers we get. And the more answers we get, the more questions we have. The more questions we have, the more answers we get. The more answers we get, the more questions we have. What drives science, what drives anatomy and physiology is ignorance. drives us is what we don't know. And that's the beauty of everything that you're studying here. And so with that, uh, I just want to kind of go over a quick little introduction. We're only going to do a few slides here because like I said, that, that background on the cardiovascular system to me was important to share with you all to give you perspective about everything that we're looking at within the course and within our cardiovascular physiology. We know that the cardiovascular system is made up a series of tubes and those tubes are arteries and capillaries and veins. And what drives the movement of blood through those vessels is pressure gradients. Changes in pressure through the system. And that's going to become a little bit, we're going to dive into that more in the following videos. You should know that blood becomes oxygenated in the lungs and it delivers those ox that oxygen to the tissues at the cellular level. And we're going to talk about how that happens as well. Blood also is responsible through the hepatic portal system for picking up and absorbing nutrients from the intestines and taking that to the liver. Blood is also responsible for the removal of things like nitrogenous waste, metabolic waste, and carbon dioxide at the tissue level. And it expels that waste through the lungs and the respiratory system, through the urinary system, and to some extent I would even argue through the digestive system. Again, blood vessels that leave the heart are the arteries. Blood vessels that are entering the heart are veins. This is not a red versus blue thing. This is a directionality thing. This is not whether or not it's carrying oxygenated blood or less oxygenated blood. This is a directional thing. Are you going towards the heart? Yes, you are. Then it's a vein. Is that vessel going away from the heart? Yes, it is. It's an artery. Is that thing joining together an area where you have arteries and veins? Yes, it's a capillary. And veins have valves. Veins have valves. Now, it's also important for you to remember the coronary blood flow that we talked about in lab. I'm not going to review that here because we did, we did do that in lab, but, but don't forget about that. Don't forget about the left and the right coronary arteries and the branches that come off of that, the anterior interventricular branch off of the left common carotid, the circumflex branch or the circumflex artery off of the left common carotid. Um, don't forget uh, about the right marginal uh, 
artery coming off of the right coronary artery in the posterior anticular branch uh, or ventricular branch also coming off of the um, right coronary artery right just just make sure that's in the back of your mind um, because coronary blood flow is very unique to the heart just like pulmonary blood flow is very unique to the lungs and then we have systemic blood flow and for the most part what we're going to be dealing with in lecture is systemic blood flow not pulmonary blood flow and not coronary blood flow but they are important for you to remember as it relates to what we talked about in lab and again this here is just simply an overview of that arterial system um, and again it is down here at the capillary bed level which we'll get into in video probably four um, about how that blood flow exchanges and what's really happening down in here um, because this is where we kind of see that mixture or that blending between the the arterial system and the venous system Um, and this here is again just a, again an overview of the various systemic systems that we do have all right and so we do have this internal coronary uh, flow right we also have the pulmonary flow right? and we have the various systemic systems that are going out and so you've got blood flow going to um, blood flow going into the thoracic cavity you've got blood flow going into the abdominal cavity uh, renal the renal system is important it's something we're going to talk about in the urinary system uh, the hepatic and the digestive tr uh, system is something that we're going to get more into in the digestive system uh, and of course you have the vessels that are going into the legs which you're studying in lab uh, and this and the vessels that are going into the arm and then up into the head because right, the cranial blood flow, that circle of Willis, is also important as well. You won't have to identify those arteries uh, and veins in lecture, but you do need to know that those systems exist. And one of the last things that I want to kind of leave you with in this video is the idea of how pressure or how blood flows through the cardiovascular system and the answer to that is it moves based off of a pressure gradient All right. and so what's a what's a pressure gradient well a pressure gradient pressure gradients is a change in pressure over some distance it's a change in pressure over some distance all right and so this diagram here shows us exactly how that pressure changes through the cardiovascular system and we can see that the highest pressure is here in the aorta it's within the aorta where we measure our characteristic BP, 120 over 80. 120 being the systolic, 80 being the diastolic. And look what happens as we go from the aorta, which has a high amount of elastic fibers within the tunica media, into the arteries which are smaller in diameter than the aorta they become a little bit more vascular or a little bit more muscular with the smooth muscle down into the arterioles down into the capillaries down into the venules the veins and into the vena cava what happens to the differential between the systolic and the diastolic the systolic and diastolic become less um, differential in other words they become closer and closer your blood is leaving the heart at 120 over 80 but by the time it gets back to the vena cava 
that blood pressure is down to about 8 over 5 millimeters of mercury. 8 over 5. 8 over 5. It leaves the heart 120 over 80 and it returns 8 over 5. So much to the extent that we don't even really truly recognize the difference once we get into the capillaries. There is no systolic versus diastolic. In the capillaries, you're going to learn that blood pressure is 40 millimeters worth of mercury. Again, we don't even recognize systolic versus diastolic once we get into the capillaries. We typically refer to the blood pressure in the vena cava anywhere between 0 and 5 millimeters of mercury. That is how low the pressure is going back into the vena cava. And again, there's no difference over the systolic and the diastolic, really. And so we don't even worry about it. It's only in the aorta and into the arteries and down into those arterioles where we have a pulse pressure, where we have <coughs> a measurable, measurable difference between the systolic and the diastolic, which is why when you try to do your pulse down in the, in the dorsalis pedis, in the top of your foot, it's harder to sense because the pulse pressure is not as great because when you get down into the arterioles, the systolic and the diastolic is almost the same. So you're not going to have that strong pulse pressure. That differential becomes negligible at best. And it disappears once you get into the capillaries. And so um, with that, that is your introduction into the cardiovascular system. Um, not as much information in this, not detailed at oriented, but yet very important historical perspective on this lifeline of fluid mechanics that we identify as being the cardiovascular system. And so with that to think about, um, I'm going to leave you to answer up a few questions. I did manage to find a few questions. And uh, I'll catch you on the flip side.